Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, scaffolding peer review of lab reports, a little thing I've been doing lately at uh, John Abbott College. Before I begin, though a little bit of a shameless plug, I don't know if you're familiar with, sal with Saltees or not, um, but Saltees, uh, supporting active learning and technological innovation in studies of education, is our sixth annual conference coming up. And uh, the theme this year is uh, interconnecting design and assessment. So it kind of has a little bit of an overlap with uh, the s subject of the talk today, which is on peer assessment. And we will have some peer assessment specialists uh, visiting and uh, uh, holding on one of the workshops. The nice thing about it is if you register early enough, I think it's May 21st, uh, we'll cover the costs for you. It's at Concordia this year, so please take a look at it, salties.ca. It's uh, you know, McGill, uh, Concordia, John Abbott, Dawson, Vanier. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, membership from across, and we're looking to expand. So uh, I'm going to talk today I'll get a little bit. I'll give you a bit of my background, uh, and then sort of talk about online peer assessment in the very general way. That, that it works. So that's, I'm going to front load that. This is the, that's where the meat of the talk is. And then I'll get into the more pedagogical uh, issues, using it uh, basically outside of what it's designed for. I like breaking technology, and uh, that's what I'm sort of looking at from that way. So I'm going to suggest some other ways of looking at it for the context of the college network, right? The online peer assessment really designed for very large-scale um, situations. When we have 30, 40 students, the advantages may seem a little bit less clear, but there is a pedagogical reason that we might want to look at that. And not just pedagogy, there's an epistemological context as well, which uh, is something that is becoming important to me uh, in my uh, development as a teacher. And then uh, the detail, the little changes that I've used to the normal peer uh, assessment to uh, process, to turn it into a, a sort of a peer review uh, process for student submissions. And in fact, then looking a little bit more like the process of actual science. So my background, my name is Michael Dugdale. I uh, teach at John Abbott College. I've been, I'm in my 11th year now. And has gone very quickly. Um, wow. I've also been involved in pedagogical research uh, for the last little while. Uh, I can't actually remember when I started. Got sort of roped in with Elizabeth Charles out of Dawson and her research group. And uh, along the way, they sort of encouraged and threatened uh, to, uh, and supported uh, me to start a PhD uh, studies in education at l'Université de Montréal. So I am uh, currently a PhD student in didactique. Look forward to writing my, compers, my comps uh, this summer. Uh, all of this, though, my, my, my area of research in this context is conceptual change in physics. And this is sort of one of these looking at it from very constructivist uh, foundations. That is to say, do not mistake me uh, for an expert on peer assessment. These people do exist. I'm not one of them. I'm sort of a teacher who knows a little bit about uh, the, you know, the broader educational context, but I'm really approaching this from the point of view of a teacher. So I will talk about it from that point of view. So online peer assessment, uh, this is a uh, very broad set of tools. Peer assessment, of course, has been used in all kinds of ways uh, in education, in our classrooms, from elementary school through university, through uh, you know, graduate studies. I'm using the term here, though, very specifically. This means an on, you know, online, first of all. This is a, an online tool. And peer assessment means that this is actually an act of, of assessment in which a grade is assigned. Okay, this isn't just sort of peer helping each other and suggesting comments and edits. This is the, the, the um, students taking upon themselves to actually assign a grade to another student and that grade is part of their course grade. 
So a couple of these that I came across in my little bit of research. Uh, one at the top is the one I'm uh, using at the moment, Perceptive. You know, heard about it at last year's Salties conference. Uh, but I'd first come across and used um, the peer assessment in a MOOC that I had taken. Are you familiar with MOOCs? Right? Massive online uh, open courses. Uh, on Coursera, they've got a system very similar to Peerceptive for um, doing peer assessment. So I'm going to focus on the models there. I have not actually played with the others. They sort of look very similar, but I, I can't speak to those. The idea, though, is uh, for these peer assessment platforms is really one of scaling. So you can imagine if I'm teaching in a university context, I might have 600 students. Now I give out my first assignment. And oops, they've only assigned me two TAs. So what's going to happen to that feedback cycle? It's going to become very, very long, and I'm going to have very, very angry TAs at me. Uh, the idea behind peer assessment is that you can scale by using the resources in the classroom. The larger the class you have, yes, the larger number of assignments you have to grade, but by keeping it, you, know, you also have that many more reviewers. And if you're careful with how you do it, you can have this scale without end. And this is where it works in the MOOCs, where you're talking 20, 30,000 students at a time. Um, the process, and here's, a, here, here, here's the, the big one. This is how it works. This is a student flow. How does, what, it, what is it a student has to do in these peer assessment platforms? Very first thing is they've got an assignment. They have to do it, complete it, and get it into the system somehow. So there are, multi there are multiple ways. Usually I'll ask for an upload of a document. Now this document could be a Word document, a PDF. Uh, in physics I've had them upload Excel files. Doesn't matter. Uh, one of the things that's important to note is that the deadlines are pretty strict. Without, uh, and that's because the rest of the processes really work on having those uh, in on time. You can't, you know, what happens once that work is submitted and once the deadline has passed and the grace period has passed, nothing happens until the grace, you know, all of the uh, deadlines for the submission uh, have passed. But now we go to the assessment stage. Now each student, so they've done their work, they've submitted it. Now their next step is that they have to uh, assess a number of other submissions. And these are randomly assigned. They are anonymized. So the reviewer is anonymous to the, uh, to the recipient of the review. And the, um, and the students who are submitting it, they are also anonymous to the reviewer. And they work with a teacher-supplied rubric. That rubric is divided into dimensions and axes, uh, and uh, you're given as much uh, guidance as you can. And you will typically review between three and five submissions. And that's, uh, that's an adjustable parameter in all of these setups. The long, you know, if you've got a very long assignment, you're not going to want to have them do seven or eight assessments because it will take a very, very long time. So uh, you would go on the shorter end. The, on the other hand, the more that you do, the better the uh, algorithms can go and extract how a, a, a reliable measure of that assessment. Okay, so this will typically take, it depends on the size of the, th of the uh, assignment, but this will typically take four to five days for that second part of that cycle to complete. That closes, boom, the feedback is now released to the students. They get that feedback from their peers. Along with it, they get comments. So that feedback consists of comments from their peers, as well as an overall grade. 
and that grade I'll talk about how it's calculated in a, in a moment. But the grade itself is graded by, is uh, weighted by the grader's measured reliability in this assessment and in other assessments. So there's a little black magic that happens, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a nice little statistical model that they use. And then the final step, there's another step. This one's really quick, though, is this final back evaluation, as they call it. And this is sort of a meta-evaluation. You're evaluating. You are now the student. You've received your reviews. You think the comments are unfair, and you think the grades are lousy, so this is your chance. This is your chance to, um, to um, get that back, right, to uh, evaluate the evaluation. This is important for a number of reasons. So pedagogically, it has, a, has, has a real value to it, but it also plays a role in the system because it uh, speaks to the grader's reliability. And that's one of those metrics then that affects the, uh, the, how, how their feedback is weighted and the grading is weighted in these systems. So I'll take an example from Perceptive and just give you a take a look at how that grade is computed. You're given uh, three components to your grade. One of them is just the task grade. And he says, OK, your teacher has assigned you. Um, you have to upload an assignment. That's one element. You have to complete five uh, evaluations of other students. That's another element. And you have to complete five back evaluations. How, what percentage of those tasks uh, is completed? If they're all completed, you get your, you know, that would be perfect, and you would then get 20%. So that mark, that task grade, is usually weighted uh, lower than the others. The other one, the next one, is the, the document grade. How good was your assignment as judged by your peers? And this is a weighted average. Again, that weighting depends on how uh, how well you're uh, perceived by the system and by your uh, b b by the peers who have back evaluated in the past. How reliable are you as a as a um, rater? So that's what we mean by is weighted. But by that is curved. So the statistical model they use is a variation on item response theory, and item response theory is basically looking at curves with respect to the um, with respect to the population. And so we can fix that curve somehow. You can either say we're going to set the average for this uh, the overall average for this assessment to be 75 percent with a standard deviation of 10 percent, and it'll s scale along there. Or it can be benchmarked, and by that it will take the lowest five assessments and the highest five assessments for the teacher to grade. That sets the low end of the scale for that assessment and, and the high end of the scale, and it interpolates between. Uh, if, in the, again, in the context of doing it in a college classroom, that's not very useful to us. If you've got 20 assignments to grade and you're grading 10 of them, you're not saving that much time uh, by this. But you can picture how that could work very nicely in a class of 600 or, uh, or more students. Finally, there's a reviewing grade, and this has to do with your consistency. It takes a look at, you know, are you, uh, are you consistent with the other graders? And this is where the random assignment is important, and it keeps a history of the, each of the students uh, reviewing. <coughs> Excuse me keeps a history of the students reviewing and uh, how they do compared with other students. And so I, I, item response theory is a way of sort of judging how difficult a task is. They add one extra set of parameters in there, which is the reviewers, and they kind of just slide these scales along with each other and find out, well, this is a guy's a really tough reviewer, but he's consistently tough. But this one, he's all over the place compared with other, uh, uh, others. And that actually is, uh, would be then go into the um, reviewing grade mark. The other element to that is the evaluation of the helpfulness of your review comments as uh, when they come back to you through that back evaluation. Now, in the uh, default P 
perceptive setup. Um, it's interesting to note that the document grade, the mark you actually got on the assignment, is weighted the same as your reviewing grade. That's considered to be as important a measure of your, um, uh, of that. So, a couple of little points here. There are penalties for late submissions and zeros and that. You can get some bonus marks. You can, this is a, all of these are parameters that you can adjust. Doing some extra reviews, you can grab some bonus marks. Uh, of course, if you've got a real problem with the mark that it gave you as a student, you can come to the teacher. Teacher can review it themselves and override any mark that seems unfair. Teacher can also act as a reviewer, just like any other one, uh, as part of that. And all of the uh, weighting is, of course, itself adjustable. Yeah. Okay, so each assessment is graded by, say, uh, four, five, six, ten other students, right? So you've got a basis for comparison. If you've and you have also graded a number of other assessments. And it throws us into a statistical model which can say, okay, assignment from, the assignment from group four is seen by most to be pretty poor, but you've graded it a little bit high. Now that might be okay if you've graded everything high, if you've demonstrated you know, consistency that, um, if you've demonstrated some consistency However, if you've graded that one high and some, another one low and uh, that doesn't seem to work with the, with the larger flow, if you're really an outlier in that, you'll get penalized on your reviewing grade for that because you're pro likely to be an unreliable grader at that point. Yep. So that and then because it is a reasonably large, uh, you know, component of the default grade, you can, you can adjust that, of course. But, you know, part of this process is to try and get the students to become better reviewers over the course of a semester. Uh, this does center around a, t a rubric. And this is, this is basically the, the, the meat and potatoes of this. How do you, you know, the you can set this up as a, as a very simple, these are very simple IT platforms. In order though to, to make this work within the context of a course, the rubric is, what, is where that happens. So you can have one or many axes of assessment. In this case, I give a you know, couple of examples of how you might break that assessment down. It might be the sections of a report. How well did the stu student do on the abstract, the introduction, or the conclusions? It could be something else, uh, grammar, coherence, and structure. Uh, and each of these axes, so you can have as many of them as you want, although you want to keep the number low because it becomes a very, they, they will spend a lot more time on this than, 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 than you expect. But the, each of these axes have one or multiple text boxes for this, the reviewers to put in their comments. Now, those, these are just defining what the axes are. How to make those axes actually uh, work is that you now define different rating scales. You can have one or many rating scales within, an, within a single axis. I'll give an example of that in a moment. In Perceptive, these are all seven-point scales. You don't have to use all seven points. You could do the one, three, five, seven, or all seven of them. But you've basically, it's a little pull down that the reviewer will use. That's a three, that's a five. But it's not just the three or the five, there's a description of the, of the standards, of the grading standards. What does that correspond to? So you have multiple axes, and each of those axes can have multiple uh, ratings. And just a, an example of one that I used a while ago uh, that used a three-dimension, uh, a three-dimensional rubric, and each of those dimensions used two separate rating scales. So one of them was the quality. So this was for lab, 
uh, an experiment. Again, I teach physics, so, and I really started to look at this using uh, this system in the context of lab reports. Data quality was my first uh, dimension, and in that I broke it down into two ratings for the, uh, for the two parts of the, uh, of the report that they were doing. The data quality was basically a rating from, from garbage to, to basically excellent, uh, and, and it was repeated for each of those two parts. Then I had the graphing details. Are they getting the format right? Are they getting all the required elements? So this was uh, one in which I really, uh, the learning objectives in this particular report were how do you make a presentable graph? And then the final one is one that I put in uh, through the, uh, every one of these that I've done, which is drawing conclusions from the data. And in fact, this is what drew me, this idea is what drew me to peer assessment as a way of reinforcing a message that is very difficult to convey to students um, through regular assessment means. Are the data, and uh, I'll talk about that uh, shortly. The question is, are the data being used to evaluate the hypothesis or vice versa? Students in science really like to use the, 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 the theory as the goal, and the experiment uh, is the thing that's being tested, and they're the ones being evaluated if they did their experiment well or not, and that's got science entirely backwards. So. Um, we'd had that. Uh, an example of sort of the kind of comments and the, uh, what that came out, this is an example of one that got a fairly poor rating. The reviewer comment, this is a stake taken from my class, this is actually a SAGEP student. I wish they would rate this way when they're rating stuff for me, but, <laughs> right, there are some significant deviations from the trend lines where you would not expect them to be. For example, in the elongation of the springs, according to the forest graph, the slope of the graph is not coming out of the origin and does not form a straight line, making the slope not as interpretable. Wow. Three on seven was the rating that one got. Uh, the corresponding back evaluation was, uh, you notice the error, but uh, I also noticed it explained in my analysis, so I might have fixed that, but that shows that he, they were paying close attention to my graphs and they got a high rating backwards on the back evaluation. So this is not atypical. They do take this seriously. Again, it's science students. They, you give them homework, they tend to take it a bit seriously. They take it a bit more seriously than I anticipated. I wouldn't have had the time myself to write out that sort of a comment on uh, 40 lab reports to get it back to them in the next week. So that was sort of a neat feature. Um, there is, of course, you know, the question, can students, can we trust them? Um, just gave an example of a study on peer assessment, and this was uh, a very you know, an interesting one. This isn't an online peer assessment. This, is, uh, this was an in-class um, exercise that was done. But what they did is they graded separately by teachers and also as uh, self-graded and peer-graded. And what they found is pretty high correlation. Uh, the peer grades in this case, you know, they're not all helping out their friends. Uh, they were actually lower for the most part, than the teacher grades. If you take a look on the graph, it's come out a little bit blurry there. So, um, in fact, the better performing students tended to be five points under where the teacher marked them, would have marked them. Uh, this did, though, this, uh, this study also kind of highlighted the importance of a well understood rubric, a rubric that was understood by the students well. So, uh, there are some best practices that are suggested uh, on these. Uh, very, you know, none of them are surprising and uh, basically make it very difficult to get a seven, or a very high grade. Perfect should really be difficult to achieve. Uh, use concrete terms when you're defining your rubric so that the students have an easier time matching your assessment criteria to what they're seeing. Um, the axes shouldn't, should be fairly narrowly defined uh, to represent a single course concept or principle. 
So don't have sort of an all-encompassing axis because you're going to have a very difficult time uh, creating a broad rubric. Uh, be concise because it can take you there. Remember, they're drop-down boxes. Uh, they, but be concise. The students will have a hard time reading long ones. And then they talk about, well, how you can, how you can manage that, how you can skip if you don't want to use seven um, of those. But be really, concision, clarity, these are all what we kind of think of when we think of writing a good rubric anyway. So, um, but be aware that the rubric you know, is now being interpreted by the students as an extra level of interpretation than, than when we make one for ourselves. You do get analytics, though, uh, online, which is always nice. I like analytics. I'm a numbers guy. <coughs> so we can take a look at, uh, for instance, the different axes in this lab report, uh, their reliability ratings. And it tells me, boy, my conclusions one was uh, not very good. Not necessarily. We have to be careful how we interpret it. Uh, is looking for how repeat reliability is repeatability of, uh, of the assessment. This says the data quality axis was very clear in student and you had a, a wide range and it was repeatable from student to student for inter the inter-rater reliability was quite high. Where it came from the conclusions drawn uh, from, from the data, this was the one that I had used repeatedly through the semester they were starting to get the idea and they all started to actually do quite well with that. And because now there's no variation, the reliability measure, uh, the way they calculate the re reliability goes down because if everybody's getting the same score, it's not a good assessment. I'm happy with it, but uh, you do get some, so you do get some feedback on your own uh, instructional designs with that. So that's, that, that's pure perceptive. Coursera has a similar, uh, basically the same sort of uh, system. Uh, why use it in our context? Scouring the web for teacher grading comments, right? Um, man, there were some great pictures. Uh, but this one I liked. Uh, I only tolerate the daily teaching is the paper grading that I live for is something you've never heard a teacher say. It is, yeah, it's interesting to listen. Uh, I think Brenda was just mentioning talking, uh, talking with some soon-to-be retirees and they're dancing a little jig about never, not having to grade anymore. Um, like I said, in our context where the classes are fairly small, this is actually not a very efficient way of offloading the work. You actually spend, there is a significant investment in rubric design and in managing the system and when you've got 40 students and managing those complaints, if what you're just trying to do is to have them do your assessment for you, this isn't the, this isn't the way to go. Okay. There are some reasons though for it over and be, uh, uh, above that. And they come out from looking at, uh, you know, we can look at the actions under Bloom's taxonomy. Take a look uh, at the usual Bloom's taxonomy, if you're familiar with this one. Yep. Okay. Uh, basically, evaluation is an extremely uh, high level cognitive task. Forcing the students to, as part of the assessment, to evaluate other students' work forces them to engage with it much more deeply. This is another Bloom's taxonomy that looks prettier, but you don't see the pyramid as well. Um, you're in, when you, you're using group work, for instance, promoting personal accountability is a, uh, is a major factor. That even when, you know, I've sort of rode my, my lab partner's coattails, I now have to re-engage with that material personally. Even if I didn't do a lot in submitting our own, I now have to take responsibility to look at others. Right? You're seeing examples of exemplars of other students' work. So you can see you might be exposed to very, very high quality submissions, better than you, you know, what you might have done. You can also provide cautionary tales of what, what happens when you don't listen to the teacher. 
These are real world examples of, uh, of that. And it really re has an ability to reify what we, when we put in these rubric standards. It's one thing to see it before you've uh, worked with it. It's another thing to actually put them into practice. Uh, the other thing that you're learning to do is critique because you're getting feedback on your feedback and what you can find what feedback is deemed to be useful to the uh, students and not. So for, pedagogically, it's got uh, some, uh, some important elements to it. Uh, from the point of view of a, the epistemological context, very quickly, because I'm out of time, but can anybody see what is wrong with this statement? And I'm paraphrasing. Anybody teach, has anybody taught science here? No? OK. This is the kind of thing that we see all the time. And uh, just to read it out, in conclusion, our experiment was successful. We were able to measure the gravitational field to be G as 9.63 plus or minus 0.72 meters per second squared, consistent with the theoretical value of G, 9.81 meters per second squared. There's a deeply, fundamentally, something deeply wrong with that. Anybody? Linda, you're nodding, well, so. Well, the, the word is successful, and, and also. <laughs> the word, is it working? The, the word successful, the experiment was successful, and, and also comparing, it's a sample, the, the, the G equals to a theoretical value. Yeah, so comparing with, with, the. Com with, not explaining it at all. Yeah, well, comparing, and this would be in a conclusion they're drawing. This would be a reasonable thing to, the, part of this statement would be reasonable. The G is this consistent with the theoretical value. Where the problem lies here is our experiment was successful because of that, not our model of gravity, our theory of gravity is, uh, is correct because experiment tells us so. And that is how science works. But the students have, really have it backwards, and it's a message that I can write this out through 15 weeks of lab reports and hand them back, and very few will make that change on their own. It's a difficult message to learn. It has to do with developing into a community. What exactly is science or your discipline? Right? and who decides what gets admitted. We, you know, when we talk about what science is, and we hear this, for instance, in climate change arguments, and this is where it gets important, right? Where science meets society. Who decides what science is? We don't elect a science pope to make these decisions for us, or a psychology czar. Uh, it, all of these are based on the notion of community, and in the community, you have accepted practices, which are decided by the community. You have accepted standards of evidence and argumentation. But that community is regulated from within, and therefore there is a responsibility to be an active member of that community and to participate in peer review. So uh, being out of time, I'll just tell you very quickly uh, what I did and what I've been doing and working towards <coughs> is using this peer receptive submit, assess, receive feedback, and back evaluate early on in the process of a lab report. And this is simulating the peer review cycle. I'm submitting a paper and I'm getting feedback that is often inconsistent and we've all, you know, if you've submitted scholarly work, it's a, it's a very painful process and often you end up with conflicting and hard to assess um, you know, reviews. You now have a reflective task. How do I incorporate the feedback from those reviews to make my uh, submission better? But then, rather than just take that as the end product, the students are now tasked with editing their submission before submitting it to me, and I will take the role of the broader community in that uh, process. And so we get high-level tasks, personal accountability, you, uh, you can get the students, their, their grades can improve because they can, uh, on their reports, because they can catch the little errors uh, amongst themselves. Uh, and the rubric really forces, and the application of that rubric, really forces those uh, standards to be communicated 
um, more effectively. There's also that reflective step of choosing to accept or reject particular peer comments in the editing, in the, uh, in the editing process. And again, it has this sort of simulation of the uh, community responsibility that one has to act as a member of that community, as part of the gatekeepers of that community, you know, enforcing the standards of, of, of the community of practice, of science, but it could be of psychology or your, whatever your discipline is and however um, scholarly works there. Um, design good rubrics, keep it simple, and really be aware that the students will spend time on this and they will invest time. And so it's very easy to blow through the piddly little three hours of ponderation that we have. So keep, that's something to keep on top of. Um, it's very tempting to have them go into a lot of depth. It will also mean that they will take their entire three hours looking at other students' work and then not have time for revision or, uh, or any of their own work. So um, there's another example here. This one was just a good example. So I'll just leave it at that and thank you very much and answer any questions. Yes. Uh, so actually, you actually, oh, yeah. right. <laughs> okay, so um, you actually use this in your classroom, but the final grade doesn't come from students; it comes from you. Then uh, we split it. Okay. We split it. If I, I felt uh, it was important to have that, so there's a one third for the first draft. One third of the grade was that perceptive draft. Again, if in cases where it's really unfair, I can go in and override that if I think that the student has been being cheated on that. But two thirds of it is her final report because you know now this is they've take they've taken their um, they've made the edits, they've taken that feedback, and they've done something with them, and now they've got that chance for that submission, and that's where I'm grading it. Uh, I, f I kind of felt it would be a lot of work for them to do if they weren't getting some, uh, you know, some value for it on, in the mark. So I kept that uh, that weight a little bit there. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Hey. By the way, did I mention salties? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much, and. Uh,